So if you do woodwork, or pretty much any kind of craft work, your workspace is probably filled with these. This is an AC alternating current motor. And manufacturers love to put these in power tools because they're an inexpensive, reliable source of power, and they can run for years with essentially no maintenance. One of the very few downsides of AC motors is they typically only run at a single speed. For instance, this one runs at 1720 RPMs. So if you need a different speed for whatever work you're doing, you've got to figure something out. For instance, here's my table saw and its motor runs at 3400 RPMs, but that's actually not fast enough for the saw, so they have the pulleys set up to make the blade turn even more quickly than 3400 RPMs. And here's my drill press, and it's got a single speed motor, but under the hood, there's a whole selection of step pulleys, and by moving the belts around on these step pulleys, we can get a range of speeds from 500 to 3000 RPMs, more than enough to cover most drilling jobs. And it's a similar story over at my metal cutting bandsaw. Now this thing has a 1700 RPM motor, which is way too fast for cutting metal, but it's got a selection of step pulleys just like the drill press combined with a transmission inside of this gearbox, and between the two of them they take the speed way, way down. So what have we learned? Well, what's interesting about all these tools is none of them have an electronic speed control, a little dial that you can use to adjust the speed. And that's because, depending on the kind of AC motor that you use, Varying the speed electronically is either too expensive, too complicated, dangerous, or it just plain won't work. Also, with most AC motors, as you cut the rotation, you also cut the torque. And a motor that's running slowly, but weakly, isn't good for much work. And what manufacturers, even professional high-end manufacturers do, is they use AC motors, but they vary the speed mechanically usually with pulleys. And that's good news for home gamers like us, because if we're building a machine like, oh, I don't know, maybe a wood lathe, for instance, we can use a fixed speed AC motor like this and build something that will vary the speed mechanically, and it won't be very difficult. Even better, it'll be cheap. Mmm, cheap. This is part three in my series on how to build a good, high-capacity wood lathe at home out of basically junk. If you haven't seen parts one and two yet, go ahead and check those out and you can get up to speed. See what I did there? Up to speed, because we're building a speed control. In my last video, we built this four-piece step pulley or cone pulley for the headstock of the real lathe. And we figured out that we can build pretty much any size or quantity of pulleys we want to just out of common plywood. And it's not that difficult. Now, I've already got four steps on this pulley, which means it can give me four different speeds, which is a lot better than one speed, so it's already a big improvement. But these speeds are still sort of quick. They're not going to give me the low speed, high torque settings that I want to do things like bowls and hollow forms, which I really like to do. So what we're going to do is build a speed reducing counter shaft. Now, you might not have seen these very often in wood lathes, but they're super common in metal lathes, especially older metal lathes, because those run at a much lower speed and they need to deliver a lot of power to the work for cutting things like steel. And luckily, it's very easy for us to adapt that technology to this machine right here. The first thing I needed to do was build a frame to house the counter shaft and the motor. I wanted to make something in the shape of an H out of a good hard wood, so I picked red oak because it's nice and strong. Now, ideally, I would have mortise and tenoned this whole thing together, but that's really time consuming. So I compromised. I cut notches in the uprights on the table saw, then glued in the cross pieces. And then after the glue was on, I screwed them together with long deck screws. And this gave me a lot of the strength of mortise and tenoning, but was a lot quicker. The screws also acted like clamps, so I could keep working with the piece while the glue dried, instead of clamping it up and waiting like an hour for it to tack up. Then I also needed some pieces to connect my counter shaft frame to the bed of the lathe. So I did a fast layout on a piece of hardwood, cut out my pieces on the bandsaw, I glued them together, and drilled them out so I'd get perfect alignment on my pivot points, split them apart with a the chisel, then I assembled the whole thing with carriage bolts and nuts, and did a test install on the bed of the lathe. Pivots nicely, looks good, I'm on to the next step. Making the pulleys is really straightforward, and I covered it in a lot of detail in my last video, so check that out if you want to see how it's done. One difference about these pulleys is that I happen to have some keyed shafts sitting around, 
and some key stock. And all things being equal, I prefer keys to set screws. So since I have the option, I'm going to use it. I'm going to notch out the pulleys and tap in the keys. Mounting the cone pulley is a little bit trickier than mounting the exterior pulley because it has to go in the middle of the shaft and unlike when we did the spindle, this time you've got another pulley to worry about. So you have to be a little bit creative. I used a piece of pipe here which let me drive it to the middle of the shaft without messing anything else up too badly. Um, I also found that my frame rubbed against the edge of the pulley a little bit and this was a great time to be handy with a saw and a chisel and 10 minutes later that problem was fixed and I was ready to mount it and start turning. Turning the pulleys for the counter shaft was a lot like turning them for the spindle, but there were a few things I had to do differently. For one thing, there's no way I was going to be able to turn the pulleys while they were on the counter shaft and mount it to the lathe. So I moved the whole thing over to my workbench, clamped it down, and jigged up a quick tensioning mechanism where I used a piece of hardwood as a lever to pull the motor tight and get the belt nice and solid. Then I was able to use the frame as a tool rest while I trued up the pulley. This pulley blank ended up a little bit crooked on the shaft and it was a touch wobbly, but by taking a bit of material off of both faces, I was able to correct enough of that wobble that everything runs nice and true. Then to work on the face of the pulley, I just screwed down a temporary tool rest and went to work with my DIY bowl gouge. If you haven't seen this tool before, I've got a whole video on it. It's very easy and cheap to make and it works well for this sort of application. I should also mention that at this point, my temporary pulley finally bit the dust, so I just grabbed a pulley out of the parts box. But if you need to make a temporary pulley, I cover that in the previous video, it's a real piece of cake. After the pulleys were turned, the last thing I needed to do was mount the motor to the counter shaft assembly. So I made a mounting plate for the motor out of old cabinet plywood and screwed on half of a heavy duty door hinge. Then I made another mounting plate for the counter shaft and screwed the other half of the hinge to that. Once all that stuff was done, all I had to do was line up the two halves of the hinge and pop the pin in. And my motor was mounted. Because it's really heavy, and because everything is either hinged or pivoting, the motor also provides all the tension that I need to get the whole thing working. And with that done, I'm ready to finally test it. So here's the whole thing assembled. And it looks really cool, but that doesn't matter. What matters is, does it run? Yeah, it does! So now's probably a good time to explain what exactly is going on here and how all of this works. Let's start down at the motor. The motor shaft has a double pulley on it because this belt runs to another double pulley up here. Except the difference is these pulleys are two different sizes. When I'm on the small pulley here, I'm in high range. That turns the counter shaft at its highest speed. If I lift the motor on the hinge, I can move that belt up to my large pulley, and that gives me my low range of speeds. And then, after I've selected high or low range, I've got these four pulleys here on the counter shaft, which correspond to these four pulleys on the spindle. So I've got four speeds in high range and four speeds in low range. And the way I've designed this whole setup, the eight speeds I have are going to cover pretty much all the things I need the lathe to do. I've got three slow speeds that are going to handle heavy or out of balance pieces, give me a lot of torque for roughing cuts. I've got two speeds that are in the middle for general sort of turning tasks, and two really high speeds that are going to be helpful for sanding, scraping, and doing really narrow spindles. So with all eight of these speeds, this lathe should be able to cover all my reasonable needs in turning. So when this project is done, I'll have a full set of plans that you can use to build your own lathe exactly like this one out of really common materials. But you can also support this project while I'm doing it. For instance, you can buy a t-shirt. Go to rexkruger.com store and check out the three different designs I have. They're all made and printed in America and most sizes are $25 with shipping included to the lower 48 states. I also always link all of my tools and materials for the build that I'm working on down in the description. And you can click on those links and buy the things that I'm using for this project and get started on your own right now. You can also click on those links and just buy anything. Doesn't matter what you buy. I still get a little kickback from that for the channel and it doesn't cost you a dime extra. So clicking on those Amazon affiliate links is an easy way to help the channel out and it's no money out of your pocket. 
the best thing you can do is to go over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and become a patron. If you do that, you'll get the next video in this series three days before anybody else. You'll get all of my videos early. You'll get blog posts, giveaways, tool reviews, book reviews, and a lot of other premium content that's only available to my patrons. Most importantly, you make projects like this possible. If it weren't for my patrons, I wouldn't be able to do this work. So if you're interested in supporting this work and supporting my unsponsored YouTube channel, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out all the rewards and bonuses that I have just for my patrons. And just like usual, the next installment in this is going to be ready Monday of next week, and I look forward to having it for you. Thanks so much for watching.